Welcome to the Mysteries Abound podcast, everyone. This is your host, Paul, and this is episode 81. This week's show is entitled, The Unbelievable Story of Mike the Headless Chicken. But to begin the podcast, are conspiracy theories destroying democracy? And this is from the bbc.co.uk website, and it's written by Brian Wheeler. The more information we have about what governments and corporations are up to, the less we seem to trust them. Will conspiracy theories eventually destroy democracy? What if I told you I had conclusive proof that the moon landings were faked, but I had been told to keep it under wraps by my BBC bosses acting under orders from the CIA, NSA and MI6? Most of you would think I had finally lost my mind. But for some, that scenario, a journalist working for a mainstream media organisation being manipulated by shadowy forces to keep vital information from the public, would seem entirely plausible, or even likely. We live in a golden age for conspiracy theories. There is a growing assumption that everything we are told by the authorities is wrong, or not quite as it seems. That the truth is being manipulated or obscured by powerful vested interests, and in some cases, it is. The reason we have conspiracy theories is that sometimes governments and organisations do conspire, says observer columnist and academic John Norton. It would be wrong to write off all conspiracy theorists as swivel-eyed loons with poor personal hygiene and halitosis, he told a Cambridge University Festival of Ideas debate. They are not all crazy. The difficult part for those of us trying to make sense of a complex world is working out which parts of the conspiracy theory to keep and which to throw away. Mr Norton is one of three lead investigators in a major new Cambridge University project to investigate the impact of conspiracy theories on democracy. The internet is generally assumed to be the main driving force behind the growth in conspiracy theories But, says Mr Norton, there has been little research into whether this is really the case. He plans to compare the internet theories on 9-11 with pre-internet theories about John F. Kennedy's assassination. Like other researchers, he is wary, or perhaps that he should be weary, of delving into the darker recesses of the conspiracy world. The minute you get into the JFK stuff, and the minute you sniff at the 9-11 stuff, you begin to lose the will to live, he told the audience in Cambridge. Like Sir Richard Evans, who heads the five-year conspiracy and democracy project, he is at pains to stress that the aim is not to prove or disprove particular theories, simply to study their impact on culture and society. Why are we so fascinated by them? Are they undermining trust in democratic institutions? David Runciman, Professor of Politics at Cambridge University, the third principal investigator, is keen to explode the idea that most conspiracies are actually cock-ups. The line between cock-up, conspiracy and conspiracy theory are much more blurred than the conventional view that you have got to choose between them he told the Festival of Ideas. There's a conventional view that when you get these conspirators, who are these kind of sinister, malign people who know what they are doing, and the conspiracy theorists who occasionally stumble upon the truth, but who are on the whole paranoid and crazy. Actually, the conspirators are often the paranoid and crazy conspiracy theorists, because in their attempt to cover up the cock-up they get drawn into a web in which their self-justification posits some giant conspiracy trying to expose their conspiracy. And I think that's consistently true through a lot of political scandals, Watergate included. 
It may also be true, he argues, of the vicious infighting and plotting that characterised New Labour's years in power, as recently exposed in the memoirs of Gordon Brown's former spin doctor, Damien McBride. The Brownite conspiracies to remove Tony Blair were pathetically ineffectual, with the exception of the 2006 Curry House plot that forced Blair to name a departure date. But the picture painted by Mr McBride of a paranoid and chaotic inner circle has the ring of truth about it, he claims. And Mr Brown, said to be a keen student of the JFK assassination, knew a conspiracy when he saw one. You feel he sees conspiracies out there because he has a mindset that is not dissimilar to the conspiracy theorists, says Professor Runciman. He is also examining whether the push for greater openness and transparency in public life will fuel rather than kill off conspiracy theories. It may be that one of the things conspiracy theories feed on, as well as silence, is a surfeit of information. And when there is a mass of information out there, it becomes easier for people to find their way through to come to the conclusion they want to come to. Plus, you don't have to be in a special cynic to believe in that. In the age of open government, governments will be even more careful to keep secret the things they want to keep secret. The demand for openness always produces, as well as more openness, more secrecy. Which brings us back to the moon landings. I should state for the avoidance of any doubt, and to kill off any internet speculation, that I am not in possession of any classified information about whether they were faked or not. My contacts at NASA are not that good. But then I would say that, wouldn't I? played the Australian theme music for quite a while. I sort of missed the old kookaburra, so I thought, why not put it in for the next couple of stories? From the au.news.yahoo.com website, has the Loch Ness Monster migrated to North Queensland here in Australia? And this is written by Melissa Grant. And if you want to get a look at the so-called Nessie, there is a photograph and a video to go with it on this article. If you visit the show notes at www.origins.info, click on the Mysteries Abound link to the show notes, and then on episode number 81, and then on the link to this article, you can get a look at it. Could a North Queensland tropical island have its very own Loch Ness Monster? Some beachgoers at Magnetic Island off Townsville seem to think so after seeing a distinctive long curved neck bobbing up and down off the coast on Friday. But marine biologists who have seen the picture say the unidentified marine object is probably a piece of a tree or a boat. And a man who has dedicated his life to studying mythical animals is also unconvinced it's a Nessie. The strange sea sighting has created quite a buzz on the island, with locals desperate to know just what is lurking in the water. One of them is marriage celebrant David Krusty Heron, who photographed it from a beach about 200 metres away. It was bobbing up and down in the water, and at first I thought, what's that? Mr Heron told the AAP. Someone yelled out, it looks like a Loch Ness monster. I've never seen anything like it. It could be anything. We are all wanting to know what it is. James Cook University biology professor Glenn Chilton says while new and old creatures are constantly being discovered, even near the Great Barrier Reef, it's unlikely to be a strange aquatic beast. 
It's probably a piece of a tree or a piece of a boat which has somehow broken away, he told the AAP. Australian cryptozoologist and self-proclaimed Yowie man Rex Gilroy is keeping an open mind. It's hard to say from the photograph, he said. Mr Gilroy, who has authored books on mythical creatures, says he's aware of about 800 sightings of reptilian creatures with long necks and football-shaped heads. Some of those were from the Magnetic Island and Townsville area, he said. The most recent was in October last year, when a fisherman saw a creature with a large grey-coloured body protruding from waters off Magnetic Island, he said. While Mr Gilroy is keeping an open mind about Friday's sighting, he said it could very well be a dragon boat which sunk off Townsville last week. An expedition to a remote part of northern Australia has uncovered three new vertebrate species, isolated for millions of years, with scientists on Monday calling the area a lost world. From the phys.org website, a lost world is discovered in remote Australia. Conrad Hoskin from James Cook University and a National Geographic film crew were dropped by helicopter onto the rugged Cape Melville mountain range on Cape York Peninsula earlier this year and were amazed at what they found. It included a bizarre looking leaf tail gecko, a gold coloured skink, a type of lizard and a brown spotted yellow boulder dwelling frog, none of them ever seen before. The top of Cape Melville is a lost world. Finding these new species up there is the discovery of a lifetime. I'm still amazed and buzzing from it, said Hoskin, a tropical biologist from the Queensland-based university. Finding three new, obviously distinct vertebrates would be surprising enough in somewhere poorly explored, like New Guinea, let alone Australia, a country we think we've explored pretty well. The virtually impassable mountain range is home to millions of black granite boulders the size of cars and houses piled hundreds of metres high, eroded in places after being thrust up through the earth millions of years ago. While surveys had previously been conducted in the boulder fields around the base of Cape Melville, a plateau of boulder-strewn rainforest on top identified by satellite imagery, has remained largely unexplored, fortressed by massive boulder walls. Within days of arriving, the team had discovered the three new species, as well as a host of other interesting finds that Hoskins said may also be new to science. The highlight was the leaf-tailed gecko, a primitive-looking 20-centimetre-long creature that is an ancient relic from a time when rainforest was more widespread in Australia. The Cape Melville leaf-tailed gecko, which has huge eyes and a long, slender body, is highly distinct from its relatives and has been named Celtuarius eximius, Oscan said with the findings detailed in the latest edition of the international journal Zootaxa. The second I saw the gecko, I knew it was a new species. Everything about it was obviously distinct, he said. Highly camouflaged, the geckos sit motionless, head down, waiting to ambush passing insects and spiders. The Cape Melville Shade Skink is also restricted to moist, rocky rainforest on the plateau and is highly distinct from its relatives, which are found in the rainforests to the south. Also discovered was a small boulder-dwelling frog, the blotched boulder frog, which during the dry season lives deep in the labyrinth of the boulder field where conditions are cool and moist, 
allowing female frogs to lay their eggs in wet cracks in the rocks. In the absence of water, the tadpole develops within the egg and a fully formed frog hatches out. Once the summer wet season begins, the frogs emerge on the surface of the rocks to feed and breed in the rain. Tim Lehman, a National Geographic photographer and Harvard University researcher who joined Hoskin on the expedition, said he was stunned to know such undiscovered places remained. What's really exciting about this expedition is that in a place like Australia, which people think is fairly well explored, there are still places like Cape Melville where there are all these species to discover, he said. There's still a big world out there to explore. According to National Geographic, the team plans to return to Cape Melville within months to search for new species, including snails, spiders and perhaps even small mammals. All the animals from Cape Melville are incredible just for their ability to persist for millions of years in the same area and not go extinct. It's just mind-blowing, Hoskin said. From the www.theage.com.au website, an article by Deborah Goff. Dead birds, it's not just a freak event. Mutton birds are dying in their thousands nearly every year, and much more frequently than ever before, washing up on the coast from Coffs Harbour to Tasmania, here in Australia. On South Melbourne and Port Melbourne beaches on Wednesday, beach cleaning contractor David Martinez picked up more than 150 short-tailed shearwater birds, a species of mutton bird. One day last week, he picked up a similar number. At Lord Howe Island this month, 200 shearwater birds washed up for the first time in many years, Monash University seabird biologist Jennifer Lavers said. These deaths en masse, known as wrecks, have been reported along the coast from Coffs Harbour to Tasmania, she said. The short-tailed shearwater birds migrate 10,000 kilometres from the Bering Sea between Alaska and Japan to Australian shores in late September to nest. Dr Laver said they have eaten little on their journey and are exhausted by the flight. She said it was normal for wrecks to occur every 10 years, and this usually indicated a particularly poor year for the birds, with storms or no fish available on arrival. However, major wrecks have occurred every second year since 2007, pointing to a wider problem, she said. We need to start asking the question of what is going on in the marine environment, Dr Labors said. This isn't just a hiccup. This isn't just a freak event. It is not just that the fish have decided to relocate themselves for one or two or three years. This is obviously an indication of a much wider problem. Dr Lavers said the birds started washing up on the beach in late September. By this time, the female birds are often carrying their only egg for the year and journey to sea to hunt for food with breeding males. Dr Lavers hypothesised that they may have failed to find fish and this may have contributed to the deaths. You don't want to lose your adult breeders. It spells trouble for the species, she says. Department of Environment and Primary Industries Senior Biodiversity Officer Mandy Watson said in a statement that the feed available in the northern summer could affect the bird's journey as well as storms. Stormy weather and strong winds make it difficult for birds if they are already in poor condition from the long migration, and this can be enough to cause their death, 
Miss Watson said. It is common for large numbers of short-tailed shearwaters not to make it. Dr Lavers agreed that weather could play a role. Heavy winds will do great things to them, but is it just the wind? I would say no, she said. Weather Bureau forecaster Andrea Peace confirmed that Melbourne airport wind records since 1971 show October had been the equal windiest month on record, based on average winds. The average wind speed was 23 kilometres per hour for the month. Dr Lavers said that there were many bird rescue groups in Melbourne and advised untrained beachgoers not to touch them. She said that even after a long journey, they were often feisty and could leave bloody gashes on hands and arms. Miss Watson said all native wildlife was protected in Victoria. Because of the risk of being bitten or any disease the birds may carry, unqualified people should avoid handling the birds if possible, she said. She moved amid the bland perfume that breathes of heaven's balmiest isle. Her eyes had starlight's azure gloom and a glimpse of heaven, her smile. From the blogs.smithsonianmag.com website, from their past imperfect series, Edgar Allan Poe tried and failed to crack the mysterious murder case of Mary Rogers. John Anderson's Liberty Street Cigar Shop was no different from the dozens of other tobacco emporiums frequented by the newspapermen of New York City. Their only reason it was so crowded was Mary Rogers. Mary was the teenage daughter of a widowed boarding house keeper, and her beauty was the stuff of legend. A poem dedicated to her visage appeared in the New York Herald, and during her time clerking at John Anderson's shop, she bestowed her heavenly smile upon writers like James Fenimore Cooper and Washington Irving, who would visit to smoke and flirt during breaks from their offices nearby. In 1838, the cigar girl with the dainty figure and pretty face went out and failed to return. Her mother discovered what appeared to be a suicide note. The New York Sun reported that the coroner had examined the letter and concluded the author had a fixed and unalterable determination to destroy herself. But a few days later, Mary returned home, alive and well. She had been, it turned out, visiting a friend in Brooklyn. The son, which three years earlier had been responsible for the great moon hoax, was accused of manufacturing Mary's disappearance to sell newspapers. Her boss, John Anderson, was suspected of being in on the scheme, for after Mary returned, his shop was busier than ever. Still, the affair blew over, and Mary settled back into her role as an object of admiration for New York's literary set. By 1841, she was engaged to Daniel Payne, a cork cutter and boarder in her mother's house. On Sunday, July 25th, Mary announced plans to visit relatives in New Jersey and told Payne and her mother she'd be back the next day. The night Mary ventured out, a severe storm hit New York, and when Mary failed to return the next morning, her mother assumed she'd gotten caught in bad weather and delayed her trip home. By Monday night, Mary still hadn't come back, and her mother was concerned enough to place an advertisement in the following day's sun, asking for anyone who might have seen Mary to have the girl contact her 
as it is supposed some accident has befallen her. Foul play was not suspected. On July 28, some men were out for a stroll near Sybil's Cave, a bucolic Hudson Riverside spot in Hoboken, New Jersey, when a bobbing figure caught their attention. Rowing out in a small boat, they dragged what turned out to be the body of a young woman back to the shore. Crowds gathered, and within hours a former fiancé of Mary's identified the body as hers. According to the coroner, her dress and hat were torn, and her body looked as though it had taken a beating. She was also, the coroner took care to note, not pregnant, and had evidently been a person of chastity and correct habits. Questions abounded. Had Mary been killed by someone she knew? Had she been a victim of a random crime opportunity? Something New Yorkers increasingly worried about as the city grew and young women strayed farther and farther from the family parlour. Why hadn't the police of New York or Hoboken spotted Mary and her attacker? The Herald, The Sun and The Tribune all put Mary on their front pages and no detail was too lurid. Graphic descriptions of Mary's body appeared in each paper, along with vivid theories about what her killer or killers might have done to her. More than anything, they demanded answers. Suspicion fell immediately upon Daniel Payne, Mary's fiancé. Perhaps one or the other had threatened to leave and Payne killed her, either to get rid of her or to prevent her from breaking their engagement. He produced an airtight alibi for his whereabouts during Mary's disappearance, but that didn't stop The New Yorker, a publication unrelated to the current magazine of that name, from suggesting in August of 1841 that he'd had a hand in Mary's death. There is one point in Mr Payne's testimony which is worthy of remark. It seems he had been searching for Miss Rogers, his betrothed, two or three days. Yet when he was informed on Wednesday evening that her body had been found at Hoboken, he did not go to see it or inquire into the matter. In fact, it appears that he never went at all, although he had been there inquiring for her before. This is odd and should be explained. If Payne hadn't killed Mary, it was theorised, she'd been caught by a gang of criminals. This idea was given further credence later that August, when two Hoboken boys were out in the woods collecting sassafras for their mother, tavern owner Frederica Loss, happened upon several items of women's clothing. The Herald reported that the clothes had all evidently been there at least three or four weeks. They were all mildewed down hard. The grass had grown around and over some of them. The scarf and the petticoat were crumpled up as if in a struggle. The most suggestive item was a handkerchief embroidered with the initials M.R. The discovery of the clothes catapulted loss into minor celebrity. She spoke with reporters at length about Mary, whom she claimed to have seen in the company of a tall, dark stranger on the evening of July 25. The two had ordered lemonade and then taken their leave from Loss's tavern. Later that night, she said, she heard a scream coming from the woods. At the time, she thought it was one of her sons, but after going out to investigate and finding her boy safely inside, she decided it must have been an animal. In light of the clothing discovery so close to her tavern, though, she now felt certain it had come from Mary. The Herald and other papers took this as evidence that strangers had indeed absconded with Mary, but despite weeks of breathless speculation, no further clues were found and no suspects identified. The city moved on and Mary's story became yesterday's news, only to return to the headlines. In October 1841, Daniel Payne went on a drinking binge that carried him to Hoboken. After spending October 7 going from tavern to tavern to tavern, he entered a pharmacy and bought a vial of laudanum. He stumbled down to where Mary's body had been brought to shore, 
collapsed onto a beach and died, leaving a note behind. To the world, here I am on the very spot. May God forgive me for my misspent life. The consensus was that his heart had been broken. While the newspapers had their way with Mary's life and death, Edgar Allan Poe turned to fact-based fiction to make sense of the case. Working in the spring of 1842, Edgar Allan Poe transported Mary's tale to Paris and in The Mystery of Marie Roger, he gave her a slightly more francophone name and a job in a perfume shop, but the details otherwise match exactly. The opening of Poe's story makes his intent clear. The extraordinary details which I am now called upon to make public will be found to form as regards sequence of time, the primary branch of a series of scarcely intelligible coincidences, whose secondary or concluding branch will be recognised by all readers in the late murder of Mary Cecilia Rogers at New York. A sequel to The Murders in the Rue Morgue, widely considered the first detective story ever set to print, the mystery of Marie Roger would see the detective Dupin solve the young woman's murder. In shopping the story to editors, Poe suggested he'd gone beyond mere storytelling. Under the pretense of showing how Dupin unraveled the mystery of Marie's assassination, I, in fact, enter into a very rigorous analysis of the real tragedy in New York. Though he appropriated the details of Mary's story, Poe still faced the very real challenge of actually solving the murder when the police were no closer than they'd been in July 1841. Like many other stories of the mid-19th century, the mystery of Marie Roger was serialised, appearing in November issues of Snowden's Ladies' Companion. The third part, in which Dupin put together the details of the crime but left the identity of the criminal up in the air, was to appear at the end of the month, but a shocking piece of news delayed the first instalment. In October 1842, Frederica Loss was accidentally shot by one of her sons and made a deathbed confession regarding Mary Rogers. The tall dark man she'd seen the girl with in July 1841 had not been a stranger. She knew him. The Tribune reported, on the Sunday of Miss Rogers' disappearance, she came to her house from this city in company with a young physician who undertook to produce for her a premature delivery. Premature delivery being a euphemism for abortion. The procedure had gone wrong, Loss said, and Mary had died. After disposing of her body in the river, one of Loss's sons had thrown her clothes in a neighbour's pond and then, after having second thoughts, scattered them in the woods. While Loss's confession did not match entirely the evidence, there was still the matter of Mary's body, which bore signs of some kind of struggle, the Tribune seemed satisfied. Thus has this fearful mystery, which has struck fear and terror to so many hearts, been at last explained by circumstances in which no one can fail to perceive a providential agency. To some, the attribution of Mary's death to a botched abortion made perfect sense. It had been suggested that she and Payne quarrelled over an unwanted pregnancy, and in the early 1840s, New York City was fervently debating the activities of the abortionist Madame Restelle. Several penny presses had linked Rogers to Restelle and suggested that her 1838 disappearance lasted precisely as long as it would take a woman to terminate a pregnancy in secret and return undiscovered. And while that connection was ultimately unsubstantiated, Mary was on the minds of New Yorkers when, in 1845, they officially criminalised the procedure. Poe's story was considered a sorry follow-up to The Murders in the Rue Morgue, but he did manage to work Loss's story into his narrative. 
his Marie Roger had indeed kept company with a swarthy naval officer who may very well have killed her, though by what means we are not sure. Did he murder her outright or lead her into a fatal accident? A plan of concealment. Officially, the death of Mary Rogers remains unsolved. Poe's account remains the most widely read and his hints at abortion made even clearer in an 1845 reprinting of the story, though the word abortion never appears, have, for most, closed the case. Still, those looking for Poe to put the Mary Rogers case to rest are left to their own devices. In a letter to a friend, Poe wrote, Nothing is omitted in Marie Roger, but what I omitted myself. All that is mystification. When we think of cryptozoology, we usually think of Bigfoot, the Yeti and the Loch Ness Monster. Creatures that are, let's face it, probably legendary. But some cryptids are real. Just ask the platypus, okapi and giant squid. Of course all of those are former cryptids. They've long since been officially discovered. But the fact is that all these creatures were not so long ago considered the stuff of myths and hoaxes by serious zoologists, and that something like the platypus was considered just as unlikely as Sasquatch. These are all real creatures that, at least for a moment, blurred the line between zoology and cryptozoology. The platypus. You might want to argue that while the animals on this list were certainly once cryptids, they belong in a different category from the likes of Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, both of which are massively unlikely to exist and are clearly the stuff of fringe theory and pseudoscience. And while I would generally agree with that assertion, I still have to say, have you looked at a platypus recently? Never has a real animal more completely looked like the work of a hoaxer, and not a particularly imaginative hoaxer at that. The platypus is a venomous, egg-laying mammal with the bill of a duck, the feet of an otter, and the tail of a beaver. If you were a European naturalist in the 18th or 19th century, wouldn't the sane reaction to receiving the corpse of such a creature from its supposed home in Australia be to say that it was a practical joke? While describing a carcass of the creature for the journal Nature's Miscellany in 1799, the well-respected English zoologist George Shaw began and ended his description with the acknowledgement that this might just be a crazy hoax. Of all the mammalia yet known, it seems the most extraordinary in its conformation. Exhibiting the perfect resemblance of the beak of a duck engrafted on the head of a quadruped. So accurate is the similitude that, at first view, it naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation by artificial means. The very epidermis, proportion, features, manner of opening and other particulars of the beak of a shoveler or other broad bill species of duck presenting themselves to the view. Nor is it without the most minute and rigid examination that we can persuade ourselves of its being the real beak or snout of a quadruped. On a subject so extraordinary as the present, a degree of scepticism is not only pardonable, but laudable, and I ought perhaps to, to acknowledge that I almost doubt the testimony of my own eyes with respect to the structure of this animal's beak, yet must confess that I can perceive no appearance of any deceptive preparation, and the edges of the rictus, the insertion, and when tried by the test of maceration in water, 
so as to render every part completely movable seem perfectly natural. Nor can the most accurate examination of expert anatomists discover any deception in this particular. Shaw was, it seems, basically convinced that the platypus was real. But he also was obviously trying to cover himself in case it turned out to be that he had been hoodwinked. According to the famous surgeon Robert Knox, Shaw's contemporaries were less charitable. With many writing the thing off as a forgery made by Chinese sailors, who had earlier perpetrated a similar hoax with a supposed mermaid. It wouldn't be until nearly a century after Shaw's time that the platypus's existence was definitively confirmed, and it endures as the ultimate proof that nothing is too ridiculous to be real. The Okapi the platypus took a long time to gain zoological acceptance because it was so unlike any other animal and because its Australian habitat was so isolated from the European scientific community, which until the early 20th century had near exclusive domain over which animals were real and which were fake. The okapi on the other hand was something rather different. Its central African habitat was well known to European explorers and it looked very much like some sort of zebra or donkey, although as it happens its closest relative is actually the giraffe. Surely zoologists couldn't have missed something like that during all their expeditions. And yet it wasn't until 1901 that the Akapi was officially described. There are a few reasons for this. Their natural habitat which today is entirely confined to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is in incredibly dense forest, and they are generally quiet, solitary animals. No other African animal of even remotely comparable size is quite so completely isolated from human experience, and that's why it evaded detection so long. To be fair, the indigenous Africans were definitely aware of its existence before 1901, but even then it appears that their interactions with it were limited, and their knowledge of the Okapi came more from hoof marks and tracks than direct contact. Sir Henry Stanley, most famous for asking, Dr Livingston I presume, provided the first European description of the Okapi during his travels in the region in 1890. But he could offer no conclusive evidence of such a beast. It wouldn't be until 1901 that the zoologist and imperial official Sir Harry Johnson, with a lot of help from native inhabitants, was able to get his hands on an Okapi skull and a couple of skins. And it was with this evidence that the creature's existence was at last confirmed. And finally, the giant squid. If you're looking to hide a gigantic undiscovered beast, then you really need to put it in the ocean. And no, a Scottish lake will not work as a substitute. While some jungles are dense and remote enough to hide something like the Okapi, only the ocean depths could hide something of the magnitude of the giant squid. This aquatic monster, along with its even bigger cousin, the colossal squid, can grow to well over 40 feet long, and yet more than 2,000 years elapsed between its first sighting and its confirmation as an actual species. Reports of the squid go all the way back to Aristotle, and the Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder offers a reasonably accurate description of a giant squid in natural history. In what has to be a first for ancient writers, Pliny actually manages to underestimate the size of the beast, saying it's only about 30 feet long. The giant squid also might be the inspiration for any number of mythological creatures including the Kraken of Norse mythology, the Scylla of Greek mythology, and the Lusca of Caribbean folklore. The problem with the giant and colossal squid is that the ocean is a very big place, and they don't generally hang out near the surface, which is where humans tend to be, with all that oxygen. That automatically limits how much humans could know about the creatures, 
and early zoologists were faced with the unenviable task of distinguishing legitimate reports from wild tales of sea serpents and monsters from the deep. Squid specimens would sometimes wash ashore, but these were rarely complete carcasses, and they tended to rot so quickly that it was difficult to say anything about them with certainty. In fact, several early squid carcasses were interpreted not as beasts at all, but rather as mermen. In a context like that, where science and superstition so freely intermixed, it's not hard to understand why the squid remained mysterious for so long. The first confirmed discovery of a giant squid carcass came in the 1870s. But it wasn't until the past decade that zoologists were able to take photographs of a live specimen. The trouble with real cryptids. There are plenty of other now famous animals that began as cryptids. The Komodo dragon of Borneo was not accepted by the European zoological community until 1910, while the mountain gorilla remained unknown until two of them were shot in 1902. Both of these species come from highly isolated areas. One of the mountain gorilla's natural habitats is actually called the Bawindi Impenetrable Forest, and their discoveries probably share credit for inspiring pop culture's most famous depiction of cryptozoology, King Kong. If we examine these case of real cryptids, a few patterns emerge. These are all creatures that live in extremely isolated parts of the world. These are generally areas that don't just discourage human exploration, but almost make the task fundamentally impossible like the ocean depths or extremely dense forests. Most of these are either solitary creatures or otherwise display behaviours that make them naturally averse to interacting with humans. While more fantastical cryptids like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot are generally said to be solitary, there's really no way around that since we've never seen them. They are supposedly located in fairly well explored, well understood areas that would not be able to support a large, undiscovered species. I hesitate to say that we will never discover any more cryptids on the scale of the giant squid or the okapi, but we're fast running out of places to look. The ocean may well have some reasonably large species that remain undiscovered, but they're likely to be more along the lines of the four-foot-long coelacanth than the forty-foot-long giant squid. Still, all these animals are an important reminder that tons of species begin as the stuff of cryptozoology before passing into the official ranks of zoology. Unless you restrict your definition of cryptozoology to only include the pseudoscientific search for the Yeti or Bigfoot, which we would argue is a pointlessly narrow definition, then what cryptozoology really deals with are animals who are known only through anecdotal evidence and rumoured sightings. As all these creatures demonstrate, there are plenty of animals for which the legends were absolutely true. Welcome to the Mysteries Abound podcast, everyone. This is your host, Paul, and this is episode 81. This week's show is entitled The Unbelievable Story of Mike the Headless Chicken. But to begin the podcast, are conspiracy theories destroying democracy? And this is from the bbc.co.uk website, and it's written by Brian Wheeler. The more information we have about what governments and corporations are up to, the less we seem to trust them. Will conspiracy theories eventually destroy democracy? What if I told you I had conclusive proof that the moon landings were faked, 
but I had been told to keep it under wraps by my BBC bosses acting under orders from the CIA, NSA and MI6. Most of you would think I had finally lost my mind. But for some, that scenario, a journalist working for a mainstream media organisation, being manipulated by shadowy forces to keep vital information from the public, would seem entirely plausible, or even likely. We live in a golden age for conspiracy theories. There is a growing assumption that everything we are told by the authorities is wrong, or not quite as it seems. That the truth is being manipulated or obscured by powerful vested interests, and in some cases, it is. The reason we have conspiracy theories is that sometimes governments and organisations do conspire, says Observer columnist and academic John Norton. It would be wrong to write off all conspiracy theorists as swivel-eyed loons with poor personal hygiene and halitosis, he told a Cambridge University Festival of Ideas debate. They are not. Olsen swore to take care of him for the rest of his life, feeding him milk and water with syringes. Mike was doing so well he even gained weight, determining Lloyd to call him a robust chicken, a fine specimen of a chicken, except for not having a head. The five-and-a-half-month-old rooster soon became famous. Nicknamed the Headless Wonder Chicken, he toured the country and people paid 25 cents to see his body wandering about with not a care in the world. At one point, Mike was earning $4,500 a month and was valued at $10,000. More than any other chicken, that's for sure. According to the website dedicated to him, his fame and fortune would earn him recognition in Life and Time magazines. It goes without saying there was a Guinness World Record in all of this. After two years, the fame got to him and Mike was found dead in his hotel room, having overdosed on illegal drugs. This is only half true, as the Wonder Chicken did die in a hotel room in Arizona, but only because Olsen was unable to find the eyedropper used to clear Miracle Mike's open esophagus. Welcome to the Mysteries Abound podcast, everyone. This is your host, Paul, and this is episode 81. This week's show is entitled, The Unbelievable Story of Mike, the Headless Chicken. But to begin the podcast, are conspiracy theories destroying democracy? And this is from the bbc.co.uk website, and it's written by Brian Wheeler. The more information we have about what governments and corporations are up to, the less we seem to trust them. Will conspiracy theories eventually destroy democracy? What if I told you I had conclusive proof that the moon landings were faked, but I had been told to keep it under wraps by my BBC bosses acting under orders from the CIA, NSA and MI6. Most of you would think I had finally lost my mind. But for some, that scenario, a journalist working for a mainstream media organisation, being manipulated by shadowy forces to keep vital information from the public, would seem entirely plausible, or even likely. We live in a golden age for conspiracy theories. There is a growing assumption that everything we are told by the authorities is wrong, or not quite as it seems. That the truth is being manipulated or obscured by powerful vested interests, and in some cases, it is. The reason we have conspiracy theories is that sometimes governments and organisations do conspire, says Observer columnist and academic John Norton. It would be wrong to write off all conspiracy theorists 
as swivel-eyed loons with poor personal hygiene and halitosis. He told a Cambridge University Festival of Ideas debate, thinking it was just a bad dream. The next evening he didn't even want to be in his room, but I convinced him that the boogeyman was just a figment of his imagination. I was awoken once more by his screams. I rushed to his room to find him in tears again. On the third night I set up a camcorder in his room in order to show him that there was no monster. That evening there was no screaming and no crying. I was refreshed when I woke up in the morning, having gotten my first good night's sleep in three days. However, my son didn't seem fatigued. He didn't even put up his usual fuss in the morning when we got him ready for his preschool. When my wife took him to daycare, I decided to review the camera's tape in order to find out how he slept. I'll never forget what I saw. At around 2am while my son was asleep, his closet door slowly creaked open. Out of the shadows crept a pale, naked, veiny woman with long white hair and solid black eyes. Her body was bony and frail like that of a Holocaust survivor. When she turned to the side, I could see her spine protruding from her hunched back like a dinosaur. She reached into my son's crib with her unnaturally large hands and covered his mouth. He was trying to scream, but he couldn't. The palm of one of her hands easily enveloped his head, muffling his cries. She snatched him up with the ease that a person of her frame should not have had, then walked back into the closet with him in her arms. An hour later she returned with what looked like a wriggling maggot the size of a duffel bag and placed it in my son's bed before retreating once more into the closet. Over the next two hours I watched it twist and writhe while it grew and mutated until it looked just like my baby boy. Once the transformation was complete, it got out of bed and slipped on a pair of his pyjamas then slid back between the covers and waited for us to come in. I don't know what that thing is that I left with my wife this morning, but I know it's not my son. A Trip to the Cemetery by Johnny V On an early dim morning, an elderly woman rested her hand atop a gravestone. Henry Blackwood, 1938 to 2004. She rested flowers on it and wept, something she didn't usually do. She always made sure to bring something of Henry's when she made her annual visit to his grave. Her memory wasn't what it used to be, and her brain needed help to get it jogged. She brought something he hated his hearing aids. She remembered wistfully how he never used them, always insisting he had excellent hearing despite keeping the television's volume up so high. Now all she wanted was his return to her loving embrace. Oh Henry, she fell to her knees and looked to the sky, how I wish you'd come back to me. Up in the sky and through her blurred teary vision she saw a red star. It was faint, but she heard a malignant chuckle and the star flashed to match it. Then it disappeared with the raising sun. She wiped away her tears. Strange. Was it the product of her imagination? She stood up and surveyed the area, but saw nothing. It seemed like the moment was merely nothing but old, senile, womanly mood swings. As she smiled at her silly old self, a question came to her that felt like part of a dark realisation. Could the battery in the hearing aid still work? She attached it to her best ear and turned it on. She could hear the rustling of crow feathers in a nearby tree. It probably still worked due to her husband's lack of commitment to use it. Then swallowing hard, she rested her ear on the ground above his grave. 
Her mouth dropped in horror as she heard scratching, shuffling, and a familiar voice bellowing a horrified scream. The wind whispered a secret, and this is credit to Jack Alltrade. I sat on my balcony preparing to smoke the last cigarette of the night. It was late and my bones themselves were tired. As I snuffed out the cigarette and stood with a stretch, a noise caught my attention. It was so faint that I immediately brushed it off as the wind and continued on to bed. The noise already out of my mind. The next morning I returned to the balcony for more cigarettes and coffee. I watched the world wake up with me, the cars churning through the intersection like ants, the birds making their endless racket, the shadows growing steadily shorter. As I watched and listened, I heard the noise again. For a moment I thought it was the wind, since I could see the palm fronds moving across the road. Squinting and looking down at nothing in particular, I tilted my head to try and hear it better. It wasn't just the wind. There was a voice. I tried to brush it off again and continued about my day, returning to the balcony once in a while for another cigarette. I found myself squinting and tilting my head each time, the world around me forgotten in favour of this whispering wind. I couldn't understand what it was saying. It was like a voice on the television in a room down the hall, stifled by three or four walls between us. No matter how much the noise around me died down, it was still so quiet. I had another cup of coffee along with my lunch, another cigarette to smoke, and that damned wind to keep me company as I sat on this damned balcony. I felt strange. I felt almost as though I weren't myself as if I were an actor in a screenplay of my life. I instinctively knew my lines and every move I had to make. I began to fear that voice in the wind. Dinner. I still sat on the balcony as I ate. I didn't want to eat, I just knew I should. I wasn't even sure what I was eating, but I still ate it out of necessity. I lit my cigarette and listened intently. I would hear what this voice said. I must hear this voice. For an hour I sat still, allowing my cigarette to burn down to my knuckles. I didn't move as I felt it sear my flesh. I would hear this voice, I would hear this voice, and it would tell me its secret. I nodded off. I wasn't aware how long I had slept, but the sky was dark and the street lights lit. As I awoke, I had an idea. I would pretend to continue sleeping. I would lull it out into the open. The crick in my neck bothered me only slightly as I waited for the wind to tell me what I so desperately wanted to know. From the corner of my eye I saw the moon rising high in the sky when I finally heard the voice again. It was clearer, no longer three or four rooms away. It was just on the other side of the wall. I could hear it. I could hear the words. My internal celebration was cut short, however, when I finally heard the secret the wind had been keeping from me. The antipsychotics appear to be working, Doctor. The music for today's podcast came from the musicalley.com website. The bandwidth for the show was provided by TalkShoe at www.talkshoe.com. The show notes are kept at the Origins podcast website, www.origins, which is O-R-I-G-I-N-Z, dot info, I-N-F-O.
And we have a Facebook page for the podcast, don't forget, www.facebook.com forward slash Paul Rexy, P-A-U-L-R-E-X-Y. And I'd like to say a big thank you to these people who have given a donation to the podcast. Your help and support towards its production and cost of running the podcast is greatly appreciated. Adam Granger, Larry Swych, Eric Rowlett, Finn Christensen, Russell Patton and Henry Harris. Your help is greatly appreciated, everyone. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast to help support their ongoing production costs, it would be greatly appreciated as well. And this can be done through the show notes at www.origins.info and on the front page you can see two methods of making a donation. So until next time everyone, whether it be another Mysteries Abound or an Origins podcast, this is your host Paul saying bye for now and keep well everyone.